Yeah, so this post right here is probably the one that, in fact, we should probably just go through this right now and answer any questions. So, Walker D. Reynolds, man, what's up? Not much, man. Dude, so another another month has gone by, and um, how, how do you feel, man? I feel good. Um, I'm definitely uh, busy. <laughs> definitely, uh, we're definitely uh, buried, um, but I, I feel good. I feel good with the way that our work last month was received. Um, we're doing more, a, a lot more people are reaching out to us. Um, so I, I had just this week alone, I had seven or eight calls, consulting calls, just helping other integrators with projects and stuff. So we're definitely moving the needle. Yeah, we're definitely moving the needle. So, um, and you know, this week we had a very, you know, spirited discussion with a couple of, uh, you know, employees of Rockwell Automation. They jumped on the last post, I think the post on Wednesday. Yeah. One of the big things that, so it was the, uh, let me actually, let me bring that up i guess yeah let's let's dive into that post but also i want to talk about some of the stats that you had mentioned when we were on the phone like earlier this week uh in terms of the number of applicants that you got for intellica's hiring video which i thought was interesting and also um like the amount of leads and sales opportunities that have resulted within you know q1 2019 um which is the last day this is the last day of the quarter one 2019 so there's no Q5 now, you know, there's no going back. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, no Q5. You're, you're not kidding. Do you want me to share, share my screen or? Yeah, share, share the screen. All right. Very nice. Yeah, so let's, um, let's talk a little bit about, yeah, so this post right here is probably the one that, in fact, we should probably just go through this right now and answer any questions. So. So this post was from, I think this is the one we did on Wednesday. And it was, we were talking about plant packs as an example of closed architecture. We weren't necessarily talking about plant PAX in a bad light, actually. This is uh, really what we were we were saying. This is an example of a closed architecture that kind of works, but it falls short in terms of what it is we're doing, you know? So in this video, we got a, a lot of a good, really good discussion going, 41 comments. But what I really want to talk about is... Spencer Brayson and a couple other people who responded. Right, yeah, so people I, from Rockwell. Yeah. So Spencer is a solutions architect at Rockwell. Uh, I looked him up. He's, he's out of Canada. Looks like he was, uh, I think he was a sales rep uh, for a technical company. In fact, let's do this uh, Tim pool style. Uh, so he right now he's a solutions architect with Rockwell out of Winnipeg. He was with a company green, Block Property Solutions. He owned that company, uh, real estate, and he still does actually. So it looks to me like he was an automation specialist in Winnipeg, also primarily AB stuff, and then he moved on to Alan Bradley. So he's a solutions architect with Rockwell. So he he actually. So for anyone who hasn't watched this video, I recommend you you take a look at it. But basically, what we did is we're contrasting the architecture of plant packs with an IoT industry 4.0 architecture. And so I want to kind of explain what we were talking about and answer some of the comments and questions that came up. So Spencer said that Rockwell fully supports open architecture by way of the factory talk innovation suite. We have the best of both worlds. Pick your poison and what makes sense for your application. Don't forget the world-class service and support that goes along with it. So for those of you that don't know what is factory talk innovation suite, Factory Talk Innovation Suite is essentially the result from the partnership between PTC and Rockwell. What does that partnership mean? In a nutshell, right now, with respect to the Factory Talk Innovation Suite, they've essentially um, branded ThingWorks and manufacturing apps as Factory Talk Innovation Suite. Uh, There's a little bit more to it than that, but for the lay person, that's the best way to understand it. They basically took ThingWorks from PTC they took manufacturing apps and they essentially put a Rockwell logo on it. Okay. We are huge fans of ThingWorks. Our team is, you know, we're beta developers for, uh, we're beta testers for Kepware and PTC, both manufacturing apps and Kep server and ThingWorks. We work with ThingWorks quite a bit. It is, ThingWorks does utilize uh, an open architecture. Long term, PTC, PTC, I believe strategically with their acquisition of Kepware, they will have their own closed architecture solution between Kepware and ThingWorks, a unified connection. 
but but uh, ThingWorks is open architecture. Yeah, think of it. Yeah, ThingWorks could be your data hub, almost. Um, but it could be. We love it. It's an outstanding tool. Um, but he's actually wrong in that Rockwell fully supports open architecture through the Factory Talk Innovation Suite because you would have to use the innovation suite to open up the closed architecture. So you would have to have another layer of integration. You can already do that with anything, with their network devices. If I've got to do an explicit connection between the factory talk innovation suite and all of those devices, that's not open. Okay. That's and it, and that I'm, I'm making it open, but I, that isn't open. That's closed. That's the, and the, and this is, this is a, a, a I've had this discussion with Rockwell a million times. You know, people want to know why our company, you know, we cost a fraction of what other integrators cost. It's because we're using these principles to deploy solutions. That's also, it, you know, people want to know why is it that Intellic Integration spends so much time developing uh, business applications and ERP and cloud-based machine learning solutions. It's because we're not spending a lot of time or a lot of money integrating the basic SCADA and MES layer. When you don't have to spend all your CapEx just getting your SCADA system off the ground or just collecting all your data, well, there's CapEx left over to do machine learning, right? And so that's that's where that's coming from. So this guy, Alan Cannon, ch chimed in and, and took a pot shot about the Tech Connect uh, agreement. Um, I'd love that he did that because Spencer left that. At <laughs> yeah. So my response to Spencer was that uh, Rockwell does not support open architecture unless you use a Rockwell middleware to convert to open. In this case, it's Factory Talk Innovation Suite. That's not open. That's gateway to open. Natively, Rockwell utilizes a closed architecture and is now trying to take the innovation suite to market, which in practice is paying for the is paying for the ability to map Rockwell's closed architecture to an open. One. Okay. So he he said, you know, I should take a closer look at the innovation suite. Um, the whole package built on open technology. I'm not disputing that. It is. It's ThingWorks. Um, but what I, my response to him, it did, my point's still the same. Rockwell natively does not support open protocols. So what, what is an IIoT and open solution? Anything plays with anything. That's right. I drop, I drop my PLC in and I point it, I, whether I point it to my broker and then have my applications access its data from the broker or whether I want to point it to a broker in HMI, a SCADA system, I can, I can do all those things. But the point is, is that A, it's edge driven and B, it's completely open. Okay. That, that's IIoT, that's industry 4.0. And, and, and here's the thing, the reality is you probably want that one thing that sits in the middle, that's going to be your unified namespace. But it, what he's saying is, is it has to be factory talk innovation suite. And we're saying no, that's not open. We should be able to select what we want to put in the middle. Let's say we want SAP to be the single source of truth for our data. We want our unified namespace to live inside our SAP ERP. I, I would want SAP to be a node within, within the ecosystem. I don't want it to be the center of the ecosystem, right? And in fact, with the, the, um, the and primarily because SAP is not a platform. I would want, I want a platform in the middle. Right. I don't want an application or a piece of software that is its only responsibility is to manage the namespace. I want that when that piece of software or platform that's in the middle managing the namespace to also allow me to do basic uh, manipulation of the data um, in in platform format. Right. Yeah. Again, I mean, all, all the, the normal players, Ignition, Factory Studio, there's a couple other. Uh, yeah, Intel, Intelliflux data, uh, Sorba. So the Sorba AI platform, um, S-O-R-B-A, uh, is another one that you could use. Uh, in, in Influx data is definitely a major, a major one. Uh, Canary Labs could be another one. Uh, Flow Software could be one. I mean, it's basically, think of it, any of these open platforms that allow you to build namespaces and build applications around those namespaces. When I say namespace, Think tags, think tag structure, folder structure with all of my data in folders, right? So my response to Spencer was that I'm, I'm fully aware of how Rockwell automation is leveraging ThingWorks. Um, I believe Rockwell's missing the point. You know, if I have to use a middleware to open my data, then my architecture is not open, which is the exact point of our video. And if you watch the rest of the video, watch our stuff from December and January, you understand, think a little better. 
So edge driven open with IOT protocols is the name of the game. You know, I love the PTC partnership with RA made a special trip out to Philly last year with you, Zach, you know, uh, to meet with RA and PTC. We shot content on that partnership. Um, in fact, there was a, there was a video we shot. You never posted and uh, I'm glad you didn't, but, um, <laughs> But there was a video that right after we looked at Factory Talk Innovation Suite. So as we were walking through Automation Fair, we walked right by Factory Talk Innovation Suite. There was a guy there talking about uh, doing the MES mapping in Innovation Suite. And I, you and I stepped aside and you shot a video and asked me what was my response. And I explained what the limitations uh, of, of the way that they were handling the data in Innovation mm. Suite. You shot, you shot a piece of it. You, are you, you published a piece of that video, but there was, we could do I was that explaining. Whole video. Yeah. But I, I, right after we looked at innovation suite, I, you shot a video and got my response. <laughs> we, we never published that, that okay. whole video. Cause I think I was a little hard on them in that, you know, I was frustrated that, you know, again, they're making, they're making assumptions. What I ultimately said was they're making assumptions about how people are going to consume the data and you can't do that. You know, that you can't do that when you're putting your data in an aim space because you, your data has to work for the way you want to consume it today and the way you want to consume it five years from now. So mm. don't make assumptions about the way it's going to be consumed. I want to point out, you know, me and my team are beta testers for PTC and Kepware. You know, we're quite fluent with manufacturing apps and ThingWorks. We, we beta tested manufacturing apps. We gave PTC feedback on where it was strong and where, where it was lacking and what they needed to develop. We're developing a, a, a huge global implementation of ThingWorks right now. In fact, I think it's the largest purchase, ThingWorks purchase in the world. Um, and this is a goal, you know, 150 plants. It's a huge engagement with PTC right now. So, so my point stands. I, but I, one of the things I did ask was Spencer, you know, I'd love to have him get on the podcast. I, I think that would be great so that we could help bridge this gap. I want to talk about the stuff that Robbie said. Okay. Okay. So uh, I don't know. He is, I'm connected to him on LinkedIn. So Robbie, he's in India. He's the director of marketing and sales for something. Looks like MNC. MNC. And you'll notice he says these are his own opinions. So he must have gotten smacked for giving his opinion at some point. Um, <laughs> I would never do that to any of my my people, by the way. They can I would never say that they would need to put that disclaimer in there. I think that's obnoxious. Um not, not for Ravi, that, that he feels he needs to do that because of his employer. All right, so he says, hey, let, let me try to be devil's advocate. And I want to explain, this, this is important here. Uh, without the gateways, if one starts extracting data directly from any PLC or DCS system, who takes care of the basic CPU loading affecting the basic control performance and process guarantees, okay? Should the plant engineer or the manager allow any integrator who may not be the process expert to fiddle around with performances, randomly extracting data at different cycle times as per his or her needs, causing damage to control functions, which is directly related to his job performance. The main role of the OT guys is to have the best production, right? So how would you justify total open architecture without you yourself being responsible for the production process or the control process expert? The gateway too should be provided by the control supplier, keeping the overall perform process performance in mind. I don't disagree there. I don't think you need to have a gateway though. I mean, I think that they should be building their equipment using hardware that supports IOT protocols. The future of that is, you know, Siemens is already doing this. Rockwell is supporting it. The few, uh, bedrock automation opto 22 is that your PLC is not going to be a PLC anymore. It's going to be a PLC and edge PC together in this unified. You're going to have a, an, an, an edge industrial PC to do handle this IIoT processing. And then your PLC is going to be isolated. They are isolated at the board level. And that, that's how these IIoT solutions handle that. Ravi obviously hasn't seen those solutions yet. This is why we have 4.0 solutions so that we can help explain to people like Ravi, Hey, listen, this technology is over here already there. It's already available. And these, these objections that you're raising are moot. Yeah. Never mind the never mind the fact that architecturally we we can architect the solutions to to mitigate any concerns about CPU loading, which I talked about in a little bit. Uh, I but either way, I agree with them. I agree that the control supplier is the one who should be providing the IIoT support, right? 
Um, he said, and then he followed up. He just said, you know, Kepler loads the network. Does it really support native unsolicited data transfer? Yeah. Tested he's still, out by he's still thinking of industry 3.0 where it's a pull response. He's not thinking that's of exact, a report that's by exactly. exception MQTT IOT on the, on the edge, which yeah, is why we need IOT? to keep, we need to keep educating Rockwell to, so that they could support that. So then, that's right. you know, guys like Ravi won't think that it's a control performance issue. It's right. I mean, he, and look at it this way, look at it this way. He's the director of marketing and sales, which means that for his clients, he's not advocating for open IIoT solutions. And we know the ROI is there it, that the, the future of automation and the future of industry mm -hmm. is through these solutions. And it means that this guy here, Robbie is, he's not advocating for these solutions. In fact, what he's doing is using dated arguments to convince his customers, his clients who are counting on him to give him the right the right architectural device he's using dated arguments that are moot they're invalid arguments yeah this is i and, think this is 4.0 solutions biggest opportunity in the market is to help companies um that that don't get it to trend to digitally transform and to get it and how to survive in the industry 4.0 marketplace so let's talk about what i want to drill down for the the for the sales people who might be watching this video and um so I'm going to go back to Ravi's comment here. So Walker, Kepware loads the network. The answer is yes, it loads the network if you're using Kepware for OPC UA poll response polling. You are polling thousands, tens of thousands, millions of tags. You are polling them very, very quickly and you have suspect network. Okay. That is not IIoT or industry 4.0. That is an industry 3.0 architecture. Mm -hmm. And, 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 so he's correct. What he's doing is he's making the argument for why you need to migrate and support industry 4.0 architecture. <laughs> this okay. was the, when we were working on the biggest world's largest, uh, ignition SCADA, uh, implementation with, you know, 10 million yes. tags and 40,000 devices and, uh, you know, 2000 concurrent users, the Kepware 14,000, 14,000 sites. Yep. The Kepware polling over the the dated network serial radio network infrastructure that was the limitation. If we had had IIoT, then none of those polling problems would have been an issue. And what is that client doing right now? So that specific client who's got that huge system, they are at the forefront of IIoT development in oil and gas right now. Why? Because five or six years ago, when we built that solution, the uh, I, you know, Cirrus link had not yet come out and launched the, yep. the modules that supported IIoT solutions in the space. That and didn't when, come out that, until 2016 and it didn't really even start to be a big thing until last year. Until 17. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. So, um, so, and he, here's the part, you know, Spencer chimed in he said, Hey, Robbie, thanks for chiming in. This is exactly how I imagine my phone call with Walker going. And what this tells me is, and I want to point this out. I'm not picking on Spencer here at all. It, you know, but I, you know, he's a solutions architect for Rockwell Automation. Okay. And for those of you who don't know, solutions architects, they are essentially sales engineering. Okay. They are the guys that come in and they will architect a solution using Rockwell's products for an end user. Rockwell's own solutions architects is agreeing that you should be using industry 3.0 arguments to negate industry 4.0 solutions. I mean, he's agreeing and that's the challenge. This is the reason I want Spencer to, to you know, and I think I, not just Spencer, there's another guy in here that, um, that chimed in. And I think what I'd like to do, I would really like to have them on the podcast. And, but before we have them on the podcast, I would like to show them some examples of, of the solutions that we've deployed um, so that they have a better understanding. I, Cause again, I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to be unfair to Ravi or yeah. Spencer. We want to give them the opportunity to say, Correct. state their side of it. And, you know, kind of like Steven Crowder changed my mind. If they can convince mm -hmm. you, or if not, maybe you'll be able to convince them. And if not, maybe there'll be some common ground or something learned from the conversation regardless, you know? So uh, my response to Ravi and Spencer was, listen, again, this, you know, your responses show a basic misunderstanding of the concepts we employ when deploying IIoT and industry 4.0 solutions. I strongly recommend you go back, and this is gonna be my reply to anyone who, uh, who is uh, chiming in with these types of responses. Please go back and, and watch the videos 
from December and January. Okay. So the IIoT whiteboard series, which was in December, where we, we started out changing the way you think, trying to explain here's how we're doing these things. Um, and then the enterprise solution series from January, February. Yeah, you know, they are both thinking in industry 3.0 terms and architectures. The short answer to your question, Ravi, is no, CPU loading is not an issue. The architecture takes care of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I, it kind of shows when the Easy Rack yeah. PLC for 150 bucks can send up right. to you know 250 tags, you know, con, you know, on change up as fast as a second, you know. Yes, now, even faster than that. Yeah, even so, faster. I mean, uh, se- so like, seven, even if all of them are analogs and they're changing all the time, like it's it's pretty impressive. And you know, the auto generation of tags within your namespace. It's all report by exception. All report by exception. I mean. It's and when you and when you move up from easy easy logics, right, which is in the sub five hundred dollar range, right? When you move up from there to say Opto twenty two or or uh, the new Bedrock solution, which are in the two to three thousand dollar range, you're moving up by a factor of a hundred in terms of speeds to be able to publish that data, right. right? So there in the IoT space, you have you have solutions at every price point. You know, then then if you want to get even faster, you move to Bedrock's core solution at they're basically starting at 10 grand, right? Or Ignition's edge solution, right? Yeah. Um, so again, you know, the, the name of the game's IoT protocols, a unified namespace, report by exception, and and being driven from the edge. And here's an important thing. You know, why am I so hard on Rockwell? I, it still blows my mind. Dude, I would love to show you the messages I have in here. I can't tell you how many engineers have sent me DMs saying, I love the fact that not a single engineer has defended Rockwell's business practices yet. And you guys <laughs> sent that video out a month ago. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, you know, why am I so hard on Rockwell? A, number one, it's their business practices. And number two, their painfully slow movement IoT and a lack of support for open IoT architecture. Um, you know, I, I highly recommend anyone who hasn't watched those videos to go to the YouTube channel. That's kind of where we store everything historically. They're hard to find historical videos on LinkedIn. So um, Zach and I will shoot a response to this video thread. This is what I'm we're doing right now. Uh, and we're going to tag them. Um, Jonathan Wise is the name of the other guy. Um, I'd like to, I'd still like to have Spencer and Jonathan Wise on the podcast to discover further. Uh, let me, I want to finish the, the exchange with Robbie because there's a couple of things he asked that I didn't respond in here at all. So he said, you know, Walker, you've misunderstood us. I've got a machine generating finished products every 50 to 100 milliseconds. And I can't tamper with the CPU cycle or take risk of loading the control cycle of the CPU by extracting data I need at high frequency for my predictive analysis leading to uh, root cause analysis. So, and, and provide prescriptive corrective actions to reduce defects. Okay, so let's say I wrote that PLC code or someone from an IntelliC integration did, okay. Uh, first off, let's say we're using industry 3.0 poll response, okay? We're not going to go ahead and push report by exception. Um, I'm just going to buffer these, <laughs> okay? I mean, I'm going to buffer the data for every cycle in an array, and we'll send it every second or every five seconds, okay? Um, the, the, that, that's how you solve that problem, your, your CPU loading, okay? Number one. He said that the machine comes from the OEM without a gateway. I can neither unplug the sensors for my analytics or randomly load the CPU, screwing the control cycle or halting the CPU by loading it more than it was designed for the process. Uh, this should have been initially planned by the customer in cost notation uh, with the OEM initially. Totally agree. In fact, if, in the last month when we were talking about IAOT for OEMs, okay, that's exactly the argument we're making, right? So Robbie's making our argument here for us. I totally agree with him. And he said we're not having... Um, industry 4.0 ROI issues. And I don't really understand that part, but so be careful about what you, what and how you play with existing running systems for your applications. Again, I disagree with them because we can, we can collect that data at any interval. I don't have to collect it every 50 to hundred milliseconds. I can collect it at any interval. This isn't real time. Y- you know, I don't need to make uh, decisions about corrective actions or predictive analytics every 50 to 100 milliseconds. I don't have to do that. I no. can, I can, I can run it through the machine learning algorithm once an hour if I want to. I mean, that's better than what you have today. 
So the reality is it, it's dependent how we architect. It's dependent upon the application. All right. Well, it also seems so, like he's kind of off the point on this rant, this um, uh, edge case, you know? Yeah. So he says no meaning in having industry 4.0 unless you ha give substantial ROI for your implementation. So for very slow data connectivity to have just total integration becomes nothing more than a glorified MES. And this was at the point where I decided, hey, listen, I'm just going to answer everything in video because we'd be here forever. So um, I did make one point. Robbie, this isn't hard, okay? We've deployed enterprise solutions that publish from the edge to the broker over the WAN and incorporate equipment that produce up to 20 parts a second, which is 50 millisecond cycle time, okay? That means one part every 50 milliseconds. It's about the architecture. If you use poll response, then you're going to load up the queue and you're going to inundate with, uh, the node with messages. Uh, if you use pub sub and report by exception, then the node makes the decision when to publish out. In fact, that's a core of Spark Plug B. One of the one of the attributes of the Spark Plug B definition is what are what is the fastest rate at which we will publish. So if we say that rate is three thousand milliseconds, then what it's going to do is collect all the messages that need to be sent and send them all on the next 3000 millisecond rising edge, right? It's, it's a core of spark plug B it's still report by exception. It just happens to pu publish a single JSON, you know, a single a payload. Wow. Um, and I, and I said, I'll answer this in depth in a video response. There is a fundamental misunderstanding of IOT and in industry 4.0 here. So this is actually in, in this thread, the reason, you know, we've never done this before gone through and, the, va the value of doing this, or one of the things that we are doing is we're doing a uh, training series, right? You know, we have a, a learning academy for 4.0 solutions where we are teaching people these principles and how to architect these solutions. This is this right here, this thread right here is why. Yeah. Because in or, in, in part of the reason we spent so much time laying the groundwork, you know, I kept mentioning in the previous videos how we have to change the way people think before we can even show you how to do this stuff. We got to change the way you think. This is a perfect example right here. Um, real quick, he he asked a couple of questions I didn't answer, so let me let me just read them and answer his questions now. So, report by exception or supporting unsolicited data transfer to needs an additional board and or logic to be developed, provided uh, the existing protocol supports. Uh, Siemens and Rockwell both support it. No, that's not true. Siemens does now. Rockwell does not. Rockwell supports. In, in MQTT's case, you, well, Rockwell supports unsolicited data transfer, but through SIP, okay? Um, which is not IIoT. <laughs> um, <laughs> Siemens does through the MQTT function block. Uh, some legacy systems may not have that support. He's definitely wrong. Rockwell does not support, uh, does not support um, report by exception and, and unsolicited data transfer in the in the mm -hmm. generally accepted definition of IIoT. Well, um, real, real quick before you go on, you know, you mentioned the MQTT function block. Well, I actually came across a blog post from DMC that was in January that I think they were the ones that I kind of open sourced that block, or they did a blog post on it, which kind of goes back to that's the guy from Brazil, right? Was that the um, Brazilian thing? I'm not, I'm not entirely sure, but I saw a DMC blog post about they developed an MQTT block within Siemens and you know, they also do the open PLC library, open HMI library. So, um, it was the other guy, not Ravi, but he was saying, you know, who's going to support, I, I said, you know, it'd be nice if we had ignition templates, um, you know, like the Rockwell HMI graphic library for plant packs. If we had that plant packs graphic library and ignition and he was like, who's going to support that. I'm like the community. Like, I mean, if I had, you know, however long it would take, you know, 20, you know, no, shoot, it'd probably take more than 20 hours. It'd probably take a few weeks of development to, you know, get most of those templates built, you know, P A I N P D N. you know, there's a lot of screens and tabs and trends and, but you could, you could do it. It would just take a lot of time. He's saying that no one would do that. And I'm saying I would, I'm saying, you know, look at DMC, I, look I, at what I, they're doing. The open source I, community I'm, is much stronger than any one company. Yeah, that's the reason Rockwell's losing market share. <laughs> I mean, the, the, that's exactly the reason. Anyone who thinks open architecture in any way, shape, or form is not using Rockwell solutions. 
they, mm-hmm. they're the the only people who are using Rockwell solutions are the people who are trusting Rockwell to tell them what to use. So that's why he thinks that no one would do that because if they're going open, they're not going to probably use plant packs either. Uh, they're they're never going to right. I mean, they may start with the plant packs AOI, the add on instruction and the PLC, but they're not going to use the the face plates that come in the panel view, you yeah. know, or in factory talk view. They're what they're going to do is build. Why they're going to extend? They're either going to extend them, or they're going to build their own. Right. I mean, they, they're going to come up with their own definition of an AOI and then build their own objects. And they're not going to do it in factory talk view, and they're not going to do it in panel view plus. They're going to do mm-hmm. it in ignition or factory studio or or into soft or you know or uh, you know influx data in in the graphing tools with influx. I mean. Uh, Canary flow. They're going to use these open solutions right. because ultimately, ultimately what the industry 4.0 engineer is doing is trying to get to the, get the data to, uh, to an open unified namespace as quickly as possible. That's the first thing they're trying to do. They're just trying to get the data front to an open unified namespace as quickly as possible and then create all the node applications. That's what it, that's what an industry 4.0 integrators trying to do. I want to mm-hmm. ask, answer Robbie's question here though. What's been the execution cycle of your machine learning for streaming data and what resources, date, data pipeline and hardware have you used? Just curious. Okay. So the execution cycle has been as fast as uh, we're streaming once per second and it has been as slow as we're, we're publishing once per hour. Um, I would say the average is we're streaming data once every five seconds. So and in most, in, and for any any data that needs to be pre-processed, we are using AWS Greengrass and writing a Lambda function that's running on the edge on an edge PC that's doing pre-processing of the data before it's streamed into the data lake. What resources, data pipeline, hardware have you used? We almost exclusively use AWS, a little bit of Hadoop, a little bit of Kafka, um, but a lot of Amazon Web Services. Um, they're their IoT hub, their data lake, uh, and their uh, green grass solution is phenomenal, and everything's completely open. So um, uh, we have done some uh, Azure development, but uh, that project that started in Azure was migrated to AWS because Azure solution w- solutions were missing some of the functionality we needed, um, and we were working at the time with the Accenture group, and everyone made mm-hmm. the decision. Accenture, I was going to say Accenture is a big cloud, you know, um, provider that focuses on AWS. It's huge. It's a huge, if you, if you're, if you've got millions of dollars and you're looking to, de- to develop a, you know, an enterprise wide global machine learning solution, Accenture is the group to call. Um, they, they, our experience with them has been phenomenal. We, we have primarily served as the uh, edge green grass developer, um, the, names, the MES namespace uh, integrator. So that is creating the contextual data that gets. So for people who are doing machine learning, machine learning is not just about the data from the edge. It's not just the instrumentation data. There's lots of data they want to run into the, the lake, run into the algorithm. They want to know what was the downtime event at that moment. What was the line state? What was the OEE calculation? What was the running availability at that moment? All of that has to be run through pre-processing in an MES layer. So we we do most of that development, and then we stream it uh, into the data lake. And and companies like Accenture are the ones who are writing the algorithms on the projects we're working on primarily because these are huge, you know, uh, you know, global 100s and Fortune 100s, you know, with hundreds and hundreds of plants all over the world. Right, so, right. Wow. So anyway, that's uh, that's my response to uh, Ravi. I, I wanted to see. Let me let me. Uh, uh, I wanted no, to find. No, there was another good, response. It's a good response, man. Well, thank you. And I, I hope if did. Ravi or um, you know anyone else is listening, they comment below and let us know what they think as well on this. I do want to, uh, <laughs> I do want to just to, as a good laugh. So Alan Cannon, I, I don't know who he is, but one of the things I said in the video was that, you know, Indusoft being selected as the SCADA solution is, you know, it's, it's garbage. And he said, you know, that's, that's just crap. And he said, pray tell, why do you think the Indusoft vote is garbage? 
unbiased opinion, please. I don't agree with what Wonderware has done to the original cost model, but as a tool, it's pretty open. Yes, it is. Indusoft's a great tool. It's a phenomenal tool. Um, it's very much like Factory Studio. It's developed. By, the guy who owns Factory <laughs> Studio developed Indusoft. Okay? That's right. That's so, right. I remember that. Yeah. I remember that now. Yeah. So, uh, so Marco, the de, who owns Tatsoft, so then, and then Factory, Factory Studio might be a little bit better than right. Yeah, you basically because it's your it second go versus, around. <laughs> think of it as Zoom versus WebEx, right? Zoom was developed from the ground up by the original Citrix WebEx groups. <laughs> so the guy who was the product manager for WebEx left, took all of his developers with him and said, hey, we're going to start from scratch and build the best teleconferencing software in the world. And he did a much better job the second time around. And so that's what you're seeing with Indusoft and Factory Studio. So, wow. Or um, MES 4.0 or... Yeah, so he said... Um, hold on. So he said... Uh, um, I, I can't believe he didn't know what Ignition was. Yeah, my opinion on IWS. And so... Uh, you said, hey, isn't Indusoft acquired by Invensys rolled into what is now known as uh, InTouch Edge HMI? Um, he said it's still standalone, but yes, you're right if you buy from a bigger supplier. Um, what I, My response to Alan was, you know, controls engineer engineering winners are not the choice of industry professionals. They're the winners of marketing campaigns, okay? <laughs> um, IWS's growth is dwarfed by Ignition. It's not even close in the market. Uh, Ignition is the preferred SCADA platform of engineers, hands down. Uh, he said, thanks for the response, never used it so. And I said, Alan Cannon, so I would suggest you jump in, the water's warm. And I gave him links, uh, you can thank me later. Um, and I guarantee you, here, here's something I can absolutely guarantee. Alan will send me a private message at some point and he will say thank you to me for turning him on to Ignition. You wanna know how I know that? Because no one who I have ever met <laughs> that turned on to Ignition has ever said, Ignition is terrible. You know what they say? Where the hell has Ignition been my entire career? That's what they say. Mm -hmm. um, and, that, and it's the way I feel about Factory Studio. So same thing. Um, I just want to go down here, one other response. So Jonathan Wise, who is also with Rockwell Automation, IoT Embedded Analytics, he said, while your position is right that things should be open, you're talking about plant packs as if it's a protocol. It's not. No, I wasn't. I was not saying plant packs is a protocol. It's a specification. Imagine, yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a suite of tools. I mean it's 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 a specification for a suite of tools. Is which is, is a which is a closed um, loop. That's right. Um, you imagine an automatic binding between the layers in a homogeneous Rockwell architecture. Uh, but there isn't one. Plant packs objects provide a pre-knowable structure. There's a predefined structure or a pre-specified uh, structure that um, can be consumed and leveraged by any layer above them beyond the faceplates bundled with the objects. There's no automatic relationship with plant packs or any higher level layer in the factory talk analytics stack. Correct. I never said there was. What I said is is that they um, they natively map to one another but you still have to map them. Uh, Rockwell has to build bindings to these objects. Yes, that's the problem, okay? That's, it. that's the problem with the solution. Uh, anyone who can read SIP, an open standard through ODVA, uh, SIP is not an open standard. It's an open standard for ODVA members uh, can get those objects out of a controller. If that's too hard, anyone who can read OPC UA can get those objects out of a Lynx gateway. I, OPC UA is not an IIoT protocol. This is an IIoT and embedded analytics platform leader at Rockwell, and he used OPC UA. He referenced OPC UA as an IIoT. Th this is part of the problem. Yeah. OPC UA is not an IIoT protocol. It isn't. It, Industry 3.0 is trying to hijack IIoT as a buzzword. It's correct. <laughs> it's and exactly they don't understand it, it yet. At, at every level of Rockwell software, there's a mechanism to get data out, the same mechanism Rockwell uses between its own layers. That isn't entirely true, actually. It's only partially true. At every level of Rockwell software, there's a mechanism to get data out for other Rockwell solutions. Right. I was going to say, I as Ignition can't pull data out of Factory Talk. Correct. I can't, or from Factory Talk Analytics, or without, without using some other piece of add-on a piece of middleware to explicitly take that information from factory talk analytics 
and get it to ignition. I've got to have another solution in the middle that's this not is, open. This is why I like Aviva Insight. I know you know we you don't talk about Aviva much, but Aviva Insight is completely open. It supports um, you know JSON, REST calls, MQTT, and you know obviously it supports. So it, it's a good example of what Rockwell could do is where it supports you know obviously in touch, um, Wonderware Historian, you know all that will natively hook up to Wonderware Insight, which is basically it was their online historian, but now it's kind of evolved more into like a platform for you ha kind of has like a feed and it uses like AI machine learning to learn your behaviors about what events and trends and certain things you might want to see states of equipment, right? Like if a particular pump is running or a machine line is down, it'll bring that to the front of your feed. So like, <clears throat> but case in point, they support both open and their closed, you know, softwares very nicely. So if this is my automation stack here, right? But you know what I'm saying though, right? I mean, have you looked at Aviva Insight? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, I looked at it because of you. I looked at it more in depth. Did you look at you. Ernst Van Wyck's presentation that I posted from Exchange 2019 South Africa conference? No, I didn't. You should check it out. He actually has a very similar presentation style to you. And you could tell based on his and he actually did a really great PowerPoint, like it's motion graphics and everything. It's pretty insane, but it's, it's a great storytelling. And you could tell he truly gets IIoT and how that can drive value for organizations, but it's about 30 minutes, but, um, I'll share it with you. But, uh, you know, talks about like how SCADA evolved, like it started embedding HMIs and then that's where system platform came out. So you could have PLCs and, um, you know, whole in touch systems all kind of brought into one unified namespace system platform. And then OMI came out basically to not only have system platform and in touch OMI apps, but also third party apps like ArcGIS or maybe you have some other accounting software bring in, you know, camera feeds, all these different things bringing into operations management interface, which is in touch OMI. But I think you'd really like it. It's a great presentation. This is pretty cool. OneNote. Yeah. Do you use OneNote? No. It's my favorite tool. All right, so let me let me ask you a question here, okay? So everyone's looked at the automation stack. I just left cloud off of there, right? Why is the stack built this way? Um, because it's from the edge to the enterprise. So the edge kind of is down there by the PLC layer, and your enterprise, you know, your CEO, your execs are in the main big office building up at the top there. So so who so the PLC HMI is for who? That's the operator, the man on the line. Uh, SCADA is for who? It's kind of like your shift manager or your kind of supervisor. Yeah, we'll say supervisor and we'll say control room. MES is for who? It's kind of like your manager, your business unit manager. Okay. And then ERP is for? It's pretty much executive, fine, you know, obviously. Executive, C -C -level. finance, county. Okay. Right. So the reason the stack, the reason the stack was built, and, and so we have to do the IT and OT thing. Okay. The stack is going away, man. Yep, that's right. The stack is going away. So this is what I would tell Ravi, Spencer, and Jonathan. Okay, they're still talking as if the stack's a thing. So why is it built this way? Okay, the reason it's built this way is because initially there were a lot of things that went into it. But so the the OT is the green network, and w and we used to call this the process control network, and it used to be completely and totally segmented, totally. So it actually, your stack actually looked like this. And there was people in between. And there was paper here. Why? Cybersecurity risks, right? Yep. Purdue security model came out and said, hey, you know, you know, you got to be careful here. The same people who told you not to shop on Amazon because your identity would get stolen are the same people who were telling you you needed to keep your control networks completely isolated because some terrorist wanted to make sure poison Frito Lay's potato chips. You know, right. let me ask you this: Is there information in the ERP system that's important to the operator? Yeah, yeah, like the work order, the raw materials, everything, um, or the order of operations. There's lots of information in the ERP system the operator needs. How does the operator get that information using Industry 3.0? It's his print out on his clipboard or work instructions. Right. A paper traveler. Paper. 
how efficient is that? Or a separate, you know, so separate software system. A lot of operators will have like two computers, one for the business network, one for the SCADA network. I mean, it's really insane that we did this kind of yeah. stuff to ourselves. It's, it's so nuts. It's so completely ridiculous. Digital transformation is what? It's basically, it's flattening the stack. It's getting rid of, getting rid of all paper, right? Mm -hmm. This is the architecture. When people talk about the Purdue model, basically what the Purdue model does is that it segments all these layers, right? It basically says you need to have explicit security between each layer in the stack. But the, but the reality is, is that it originally was completely segmented. Right. The, the controls group, the engineers, they owned this network. They got their own, they didn't get a VLAN. They created their own local network. Yeah. Physically okay? they had to, separate. They, yeah. They own their own switches. They owned everything. Right. Mm -hmm. Problem is, is that if you continue to run your business this way and an innovative company comes along and says, fuck the Purdue model, <laughs> I don't think any, I don't, I don't think anyone is gonna, you know, I'm not in pharma, you know, I, I print, you know, I'm, I'm printing packaging for, you know, car parts. There's, right. there's no, there's no compliance I have to live up to. What, why would I, why would I make my life that hard? Because you have to engineer in between each of these layers. You lose efficiency in this layer. So what's the, so what's the reality, the future, when we talk about industry 4.0, and I've, I've done this so many times, you know, but it's, you have the unified namespace. Yeah. So red right. and stack is bad. And, and, and then what you have are pretty simple. I have ERP, I have MES, I have SCADA, I have HMI. You have cloud. HMI, and what I want to do is do this. I'm going to go ahead and make that red because the connection between the PLC and the HMI is still a red connection. Nothing changed there. What we did is it's both red and green for process control, okay? But what it means is that all the applications Got are... It. So you just, you move the barrier down to the edge. Correct. You move the barrier to the edge and then you push your data up. Well, I mean, what else are we going to have here? We're going to make this green. We're going to yeah, have yeah. Uh, machine learning. Cloud. Yeah. You know, you're also going to have other companies and organizations, unified namespaces. There's going to be That's connections right. between, um, you know, what is a company? A company is simply a cybernetic collective of machines and people. So if you kind of expand upon that, this is kind of like the whole singularity, you know, the third, the tertiary cortex, right? So we have like our cerebral cortex and we have like our, um, you know, I forget what the first layer is, but that third layer is like what our phones connect us to right now. And eventually that direct, that connection will be direct, but it's like this all entire sum of human knowledge just sitting right up here in the clouds and we can connect to that. So, effectively organizations will interconnect with each other. I've seen people doing things like this. So like, you know, you have your customers and they may want to know what your lead time is. So then they can let their customer knows what their lead time is. Right. So IIoT is enabling this free flow of information between organizations. So now what you have in this structure, this is industry 4.0. So this is industry 4.0 and this is industry 3.0 which by the way, we just demonstrated that Spencer and Jonathan and, and Ravi and, you know, Spencer and Jonathan who work for Rockwell Automation, everything they said was centered around I 3.0 principles, everything, all their answers their They, it clearly showed that they were still thinking this way. Okay. If you want to, you know, if they, if you want to share information with other applications, let's use another piece of middleware to get it out there create explicit connections. These are not explicit connections. This is pub sub. That's what this is. Right. As information shows up in the namespace, it's accessible to you, right? This is industry 4.0. This is the idea in, in, in the way inductive automation and other companies illustrate it is they basically have all of the IT side, all of the IT apps on one side of the unified namespace, and they have all the OT apps on the other side, right? So they'll have edge on one side, which is all the OT stuff. And they'll have business apps, which is all the IT stuff. I prefer to do it more circular here because that presupposes when you illustrate it that way, it presupposes that you only have IT and OT data. Right. But what about, what about 
internet data? What about what about community data, right? Yeah, this looks more like a web and more of a node architecture, whereas the other one, you know, and I get why they do it. It's kind of a marketing thing. You know, it's like Ignition is is the center and Ignition will help you bridge the gap between OT and IT, but, you know, it, just, it doesn't need to be Ignition. You know, it, um, it needs to be in a you know, open architecture, it could be substitutable, you know, freely substitutable for whatever the best in class or for the best for that architecture, whatever the application demands. I can't believe at this point though, Zach, that we are still having to illustrate this. Well, this has been a really great session. I think that at least someone who's watching this, this was the time that they got it, you know, and I think we're going to have to continue to do re-illustrate, re-state our message over and over again on LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, in person. I mean, I'm excited for CSIA conference. Oh, me too. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd, uh, I definitely would like to see what, so a couple things that I'd like to see happen. I, I want to reach out to Spencer and Jonathan and invite them on the podcast and, and, yeah you know, have them be part of the conversation. I would really, what I would like to see happen is I want Rockwell to be on our podcast. I want Rockwell to explain, you know, how they're moving from here to here. Now, right now, what they're arguing is that they're, the innovation suite is going to do that for them. But as an engineer and a developer, I know that that's not the case. It's, it's a step in the right direction, but it's not all the steps they need to take. So I would love to have them on. I, I don't know how we can make that happen, but. Yeah, this will be an open invitation. I mean, I'm already talking to a lot of the guys from Rockwell on, you know, Automation Month for Zach's Griffin podcast. So, but I think they need to talk to you. I want to look at some of these. Hey, would you mind if we, if we brought Marcus on here to film a not separate, we could right film now. a separate video. Yeah, we could end this podcast here. And I want to bring Marcus on because he's the guy that I've been working on the Upwork IIoT Industry 4.0 architecture with Ignition Edge and uh, Ignition and MQTT and custom React app. So I want to bring him on here mm -hmm. so we can just kind of uh, go over uh, system architecture and we can kind of talk about it and we see an actual example. I actually want to start using Tossy Box because we're not using, we're just kind of going over the web. And I think it makes sense to use Tossy Box. Mm-hmm. Like we're using Team Viewer to support the Edge application, uh, the Edge nodes right now, and I think it'd be better if we had Tossy Box just to get root access to the network. You know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, let's end it here. If you guys have been listening, thank you so much for hanging in there, Rockwell. We love you. <laughs> we do. We do. Come join us on the podcast. Peace out, guys. See ya.